All right, we'll give people another minute. All right, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. And if people come in a little late, we're fine with that too. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Elaine Potter. I am a senior wash manager at RTI International. And just want to welcome you all to our session on globalization and market based sanitation. Um, I hope everyone had a good lunch. I know it's easy to get sleepy and get distracted a little bit after lunch. So we'll try to do our best to keep this as engaging as possible. Um, and we have some breakout groups for you to make sure that you have the opportunity to participate in this discussion today as well. Um, and so I think we all know that sanitation has traditionally fallen behind water in terms of universal access. Uh, and so we often look to the private sector to fill those gaps and look to market-based sanitation to fill those gaps. Um, and this approach, as we know, is only successful and only sustainable when we're really engaging uh, local actors as well. So we'll be talking about how innovation, collaboration, and community empowerment will converge and tackle you know, one of our most pressing issues in the sector. Uh, so we'll begin, sorry, I'll put the agenda up. And we'll change it. Forwarded by technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so we'll begin with a series of lightning talks. Uh, we have five different speakers today that are going to give us some insights into key aspects of market sanitation. Um, then we'll have a very short Q&A session, which is mainly to uh, suss out any clarifying questions that you might have before we dive into some small group discussions. And you'll have the opportunity to really um, discuss individually you know, what you've seen works and what you think uh, we might need to look at next. Uh, and then we will do a short reconvening where everyone can share back what they've learned in their groups uh, and hopefully identify some key themes and takeaways for the rest of the day and the rest of the week at the conference. Um, so I want to just quickly introduce our five speakers before we dive into it. Um, and so we have Genevieve Kelly um, from Sato, and then we'll have uh, Mushani Kabasana from the USAID Expand Water and Sanitation Project in Zambia. We'll be followed by Fletcher Wright from Planet Partnerships. And then um, we'll have Paula Rango, who will be presenting on behalf of the USAID Western Kenya Sanitation Project. And followed by Mark Braddon, um, who will be presenting on the USAID Integrated Education Development Activity in Cambodia. Um, so let's get started. Like I said, we encourage active participation. Um, so ask questions and make sure to share your own experiences. And so we'll dive in uh, starting with Jody. Thank you, Elaine. Hello, everyone. So as Elaine mentioned, uh, my name is Genevieve. I am a member of the SATU team. Specifically, I'm the program director of the Partnership for Better Living, which is a USA let's go, uh, uh, public private partnership. I won't be talking about that today. I'll actually be talking a little bit more broadly about uh, how SATU approaches supply chain um, in each of the countries in which we work. 
I'm going to start quickly with an overview of Sato part of Lixil. I think sometimes it can be confusing for people whether we're Lixil or we are Sato. So uh, we work for Lixil on the Sato brand. And when you see this um, pyramid here, you can see that Sato is one of several brands um, that Lixil owns. And what I'm really proud of is that Sato is a brand equivalent to esteemed as highly as, even if not generating as much money as our other brands, um, but it demonstrates Lexel's investment in consumers that have either uh, no toilet whatsoever or in need of an upgrade to achieve basic sanitation. And so um, we have a variety of products. I have a Sato pen here um, just to really kind of drive home the point of the, of the product and, and some of the supply chain challenges that I'll be describing. Um, but it includes our Sato pan as well as our Sato stool. We have alphabet systems as well as our Sato. So when considering the context for supply chain activation and looking at this from Sato perspective, I think it's important to emphasize that as I talk about supply chain and from where we tackle this, this challenge, it's from uh, primarily the manufacturing standpoint. And so we have a plastic product. This cannot be made by a local artisan at the point of last mile delivery. It requires um, a certain capacity of injection mold manufacturing. And sometimes in the countries in which we work, there's only one or two suppliers with the capacity to, to produce these products. And so again, really kind of driving home uh, for the rest of this presentation, but the nature of uh, having a physical product that is, is manufactured um, upfront before it then travels down through the supply chain. So another element around the context in which Sato works is um, pretty much in all of the markets in which we work in primarily uh, Africa and Asia, we find that Supply chains can be quite informal, especially the closer you get to the consumer, which in the case of Sato, it's typically a rural consumer. These uh, supply chain relationships can be very, um, uh, well, informal, but also uh, relationship-based. Um, you know, it's, you know a guy who knows a guy, and, and really reputation can be quite important. And in the point of localization, just, you know, this is not something where I can come in and uh, drive uh, a Sato supply chain um, in, in most of the countries in which we work. It really takes the local expertise and relationships uh, to move products. We also know from um, our experience in markets that single actors can play a multitude of roles and every market can be quite different. And so while we have one product that might look the same country to country with only certain modifications, we find that the supply chain structure can be quite diff different. I'm going to touch on this, this final point about visibility um, in a moment. I'm going to keep moving quickly. I'm reminded this is a lightning talk. <laughs> um, so taking a look at Sato's licensing model, what we have here, each of these circles uh, depicts a function within the supply chain. And this captures Sato's licensing model specifically, which is where we identify a manufacturer in the country in which we work to whom we license manufacturing of the Sato product. We provide them with the physical mold, the asset, and then they produce the product on our behalf and have their own supply chain network where they push the product through to distributors, to wholesalers, to retailers. So this is trying to capture all of those different functions. The key point I wanna highlight here is in these green sections, this is where on the right-hand side is where we rely on, on partners the most, where we have the least visibility, um, we don't have in-house capabilities for a lot of this work within Sato, but it also means it's where we have the least visibility into what happens and where products end up, and that can be quite challenging for us. Um, and it's 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 really to underscore how much we rely on local partners um, to execute these transactions. <laughs> To provide you with a more specific example, um, this a study we had commissioned through Archipel & Co of several countries in West Africa, it was actually just recently published on Global Waters, um, is understanding the manufacturing and distribution supply chain um, in, in several countries. And what they found is that when you look here, the arrows are depicting the flow of product. And what you'll see is that depending on who's doing what, 
products can move directly from a manufacturer all the way to the retailer in some cases. And this is just in Senegal. Sometimes there's a distributor that is like a master distributor and they can go straight down to um, the wholesalers. And then others have several sub distributors and warehousing partners that sit within them. And so again, really trying to underscore the complexity um, and different regions where we might work require different supply chains that we have to understand in advance before we can really work with them. Finally, I'll leave you just with where we're headed and what next steps look like and actually a call to partner with us. Um, we recently received approval from USAID to uh, start a small project in Senegal, which is to activate the market um, for Sato products, um, recognizing that there is some upcoming USAID funded activities there that may want to work with, with Sato. And so just to give you a sense of what this will look like, from our perspective is we're planning to uh, work with like a, a local importer distributor, set up a license agreement. Um, and then we will be uh, also designing like a national branding and marketing campaign that we will pass on to our local partners so that they can promote Sato on our behalf. Um, and so I'll leave it there, but really just the, the call to let us know if in Senegal specifically, uh, there may be opportunity to activate the supply chain together because we're upstream and we really rely on our partners, the NGOs, with uh, the the more local insights to support. Thank you. Thanks for me. Afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mshani uh, Kapsana from RTI Zambia. I'll talk a little bit about the work uh, that uh, we are doing on behavioral uh, change uh, strategies. We have a five year uh, project that is uh, working to professionalize our wash services uh, to enhance uh, accountability, reliable, and high quality service, uh, as well as just to increase uh, the participation of, of uh, private uh, sector. Um, the overall objective really is to maintain and to expand. Um, sustainable wash services in 12 districts, as you can see uh, on the map there. Now, last year, we undertook a, a baseline assessment just to give us uh, an average picture of uh, the status of uh, water and sanitation. And uh, the baseline assessment uh, revealed that 27% of households in the uh, 12 uh, districts that uh, we are covering uh, practice open identification and the majority uh, are on unimproved uh, toilets. Uh, this is below uh, a basic uh, level. We're talking about uh, 52%. Only 9% of the households have uh, access uh, to basic uh, sanitation. Under our project, we're working to increase uh, access to water and sanitation by 15 and uh, 25% uh, respectively. Uh, I'll talk more on sanitation. Um, the biggest uh, challenge, really, when we look at the uh, regions that we are covering, is in the western uh, region of, uh, of uh, uh, this country, where the open defecation is even much higher. 50% uh, of the populations in the western region um, practice open defecation, and less than 5% have uh, basic uh, sanitation uh, access. So this really is a critical area of focus for us in terms of uh, sanitation interventions. Um, the biggest uh, contributors really to the poor sanitation is firstly um, uh, the poverty, high poverty levels, but also the environmental factors, as well as uh, the, the cultural beliefs. The toilets, as you can see from this picture, are poorly designed and constructed and in most cases will collapse within a few weeks to months. Uh, this is due to the sandy environment in the Western region, as well as also the, 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 the floods um, in, in most of the areas. In terms of uh, cultural beliefs that are affecting uh, the, the picture for sanitation, the elderly believe that um, they are not supposed to be seen uh, you know, entering toilets, we also have beliefs around men and women not using the same toilets. And it is also believed by uh, most uh, villages that um, you know, the human waste, especially 
for the children are not harmful. So in this uh, project, we have developed a, a sanitation burial change strategy that is aimed at addressing uh, these factors. Under the strategy, a toilet catalog has been developed of options of affordable, durable uh, toilets that are market uh, aligned. And uh, we're really working to um, just ensure that uh, this information is packaged uh, in local languages. Um, the project uh, uh, is working to build up on the lessons, especially uh, from CLTS, what was working well, or what has been working well, and uh, what uh, needs to, to be uh, improved upon. And we are focusing much on uh, training uh, the local lessons within the, um, the villages where we are working. Under the behavioral change uh, uh, approach, one of the first things that uh, we are doing when we move into a particular area is that uh, we probe the drivers um, of certain you know, uh, attitudes or action uh, that uh, inhibit uh, sanitation. And then we undertake ev evidence-based uh, uh, interventions that support uh, the own uh, construction of toilets uh, by households. We are working uh, very closely with um, local leaders. Uh, so first of all, the team itself uh, is, uh, is local and overseeing um, aspects that um, they clearly uh, understand in terms of the, the local con uh, context. We're working with uh, the traditional leaders um, who are very key um, in the, the remote and rural areas uh, where we are covering. We're working closely with um, government approved uh, structures. These are the district uh, uh, wash uh, committees. We also have the, um, the village wash committees, as well as uh, the other structures uh, that uh, government has approved to really coordinate um, sanitation uh, improvement. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Fletcher Rudd, and I'm a director of Planet Partnerships. Today, I'm going to be sp speaking about our approach for pipeline development, particularly in, as it pertains to wash infrastructure. Uh, it's a hard act to follow. I am working with Mushanye on the same Zambia project that was just described, so I won't go into too much of the background or context there. But the key approach that we wanted to talk about is a series of steps and methodolog methodological approaches that can be adapted based on the context to enable utilities and service providers to bring into the private sector through partnerships to increase service coverage. So <clears throat> this is, you know, in the Zambia situation, looking at water and sanitation. In Tanzania, we focus particularly on sanitation in peri-urban areas. And we've also looked in other sectors outside of this, including an upcoming one in Ecuador, where again, very fortunate to be partnered with RTIM. So in terms of this approach, it's centered on a few key elements. The first is that it's an enhanced process that introduces a standardized and an objective approach to identify entry points for the private sector. So the private sector is not suited to deliver all aspects of services or provide all services in an infrastructure element. So this provides a standardized approach that can be adapted to the standard protocol of the utility or service provider to meet this. This also allows for an early stage screening and prioritization to identify which pilot projects to focus on. Why is this important? Because when there are a lack of resources or limited resources to commit to project development, you need to prioritize those that are best suited and have the highest impact for the utilities or service providers at hand. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the stages that follow. Finally, uh, there's a key element where this aligns with strategic priorities and national planning aspects on a ministerial and other aspects, but it also aligns with local needs. So a utility needs to focus on its services and provide, um, provide what is required to its customer base. So what does this entail? It's usually a four-step process. The first is what could be described as a problems, priorities, and solutions workshop. This is where we work with service providers in order to identify where they have the key challenges and where is their biggest issues when it comes to financing or delivering uh, actual services. From there, we work out a little bit more of the specifics. So if we're talking about non-revenue water, 
what districts is this a key issue in? Where is this uh, most important? And where is it most pressing to be addressed? We then work out the various different solutions that can be done in order to meet that, that to address that issue. Not all of those solutions will be suited to the private sector, and there are off-ramps for those that are best suited to public sector funding or other support. The key aspect here is building out a pipeline of projects that are addressing the key priorities and needs of the utility or service provider and its communities that it's serving versus a top-down imposed kind of uh, structure where you will work on this project because this is what we have funding from the donors for. From there, we go into the screening. So screening focuses on a variety of key criteria. The first technical is quite apparent, but then we look at more nuanced kind of criteria, looking at commercial viability, financial viability, the, uh, the ease of implementation. Is this legal? Are, is there political goodwill behind this for this to move forward? What is the community reaction? Is this include social inclusion? Is it environmentally sustainable? All of these factors are scored and built into an element so you can establish a threshold. Those projects that do not meet that threshold do not necessarily mean that they're bad projects. It just means that they need to be reworked. Those that pass the threshold are then prioritized based on the priorities that are identified under that first workshop. From there, you move forward with the usual project life cycle. So you move forward with appraisal, structuring, and the actual procurement and oversight of these contracts. In certain situations where there's smaller scale transactions, this may mean that it's not a full feasibility study. You may be focusing more on a pre-feasibility study, a more streamlined appraisal approach. So why is this focus, why is this important in the, in the sense of localization? Well, firstly, it's locally led. You're not working with the ministry to impose a series of priorities on the ground. You're working with utilities and service providers to identify where there's real need and where the private sector can partner to deliver these services or help develop this infrastructure. Secondly, it's a series of steps and methodologies that are adapted based on the needs and standard operating procedures of the entity in which we're working with. What does this mean? It means that it's not a one size fits all. What we do is work with the team to build that in and institutionalize that approach to make sure that that's moving forward. To give an example, in Zambia, we've introduced this to the three CUs we're working with, Southern, Western, and Chambeshi, to build it into their standard operating procedures and make sure that the ministry also embeds that in their strategic um, sector coordination framework and their strategic uh, policy for wash delivery. So I'm going to, I've had my morning, so I'm gonna keep this nice and short. Um, essentially where we are, uh, we had several results in the past in other countries. In Zambia, we're bringing to market the first transactions that stem from this process. Um, they will be launched in the next month and I'm happy to just explore and discuss further during the breakout session. Can we hand it over? Thank you. Thank you. Um, a very good afternoon. My name is Paul Lorengo, uh, part of RTI. I lead the Western Kenya Sanitation Project in Kenya, uh, funded by USAID. So this is uh, an activity working, as the name suggests, in the Western part of Kenya with at least eight of uh, the local governments, we call them counties, to uh, build um, a transformative, replicable and sustainable uh, sanitation and menstrual hygiene marketplace. But most importantly, it's a full Kenyan team by uh, a team of professionals from uh, within the region. And so Western Kenya, just like most uh, parts of Kenya and of course uh, Africa, has a set of sanitation challenges uh, that I will mention just but a few. Uh, first being low to moderate open defecation. Open defecation remains a moving challenge. Um, there's also a lot of um, <clears throat> limited private sector engagement, particularly at the lowest level, not just within the high volume players, as uh, a key inhibitor to developing the sanitation marketplace, and favorable policy and regulatory environments in the sense that the private sector feel less motivated and often uh, shy away from investing in sanitation. And of course, in accessibility of formal loans, uh, access to capital by especially the low volume players to invest and uh, expand 
their sanitation business is, is very, very limited, just to mention a few of the challenges. But then in the context of um, uh, strengthening local systems to improve sanitation, uh, we are giving it a triple approach uh, that includes enabling environment uh, that we are strengthening, of course, with a very strong team on uh, market players, working with the different uh, <clears throat> private sector players. And within the market players, we are working with both entrepreneurs and enterprises, where our definition of entrepreneurs means the small little nascent uh, 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 artisans and uh, enterprises that are still nascent but viable and <laughs> high promise to uh, really move up the ladder. And of course, looking at the customer. And one of the uh, reasons why this was made a market-based activity was on account of an assessment that was done and established that there is a real, real motivation for um, buyers and sellers to sell and trade in sanitation business. However, that demand and supply is inhibited by um, certain reason, reasons that uh, really uh, becomes a bottleneck to the market. So we also have a little bit of a focus on the customers to really understand uh, customer satisfaction, the supply chain issues, accessibility, and all that. So within an enabling environment, we are working with the local um, institutions, especially the local uh, governments, to domesticate some of the national level policies uh, at the county levels so that they are specific and customized to local issues and speaks to the local actors. And of course, uh, help in bringing together a, a number of actors, including the private sector. So within uh, the enabling environment, we are also strengthening uh, for those that exist, the wash for her at the county level, but those that do not exist, supporting the establishment. And the wash for her really is a platform that brings anybody and everybody together from the private sector to the public sector, civil society, to be able to address issues of concern, be it markets, policy, and investments. Uh, within the um, market players, we are collaborating and strengthening the capacity, again, of local institutions, uh, private sector, youth groups, including uh, local organizations to be able to engage in sanitation business, and most importantly, to see the uh, capacity gaps and identify those opportunities where they can inject and channel their investments. And of course, we are also supporting the local uh, actors, private sector actors, including artisans, to be able to uh, engage in sanitation as a business and see sanitation as a full-time uh, opportunity for some of them. And so we've introduced some new approaches like DQ cells with the support of our partners to uh, local artisans to be able to um, build their capacity and be able to engage uh, uh, households in building the sanitation markets. So we are also working with uh, the local actors, particularly the county governments and the national government to advocate for high level political uh, interventions that are necessary, including uh, unlocking public financing to support sanitation issues. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be talking about our project in Cambodia, and there are some colleagues here who might be able to answer questions that I can't even answer about Cambodia, so feel free to be very specific and technical for them. <laughs> uh, first, I'm going to start about the context. It's a little different than the other situations we were talking about, partially because of the work of other partners, including ID, who are here. But in 2008, the World Bank, ID, the Toilet Board Organization, and Watershed, which was out of UNC, um, all really invested heavily in a market-based approach in Cambodia, and they helped work with local businesses and really build a strong foundation and network to deliver sanitation through the private sector in rural Cambodia. By 2018, through um, ID reports, they were finding that there was already some market saturation and that there was 70% latrine coverage, which was primarily done through the private sector, through Cambodian-run latrine businesses. 
Um, since that 2008 period, they've sold more than 300,000 latrines. And at the moment, there's about 2 million or 60% of Cambodians in rural areas that practice open defecation. And so with this in mind, they have gotten more sophisticated in the approaches of how to engage rural clients or rural customers in the market. And recently in 2021, Watershed, which was working in this space, actually exited Cambodia, um, saying that they have really invested sufficiently that there is a sustainable infrastructure in place that will continue the sales without them. So what's interesting about that is the, those 16% of people or those 2 million rural Cambodians um, don't have latrines because they are the last mile population who have unique needs. And the latrine business owners who have been serving clients who live in more normal conditions um, don't really know how to reach these people because they either live in areas with difficult geographic conditions such as rocky soil or very frequent flooding or are in a floating village, or this is the extreme poor who could not contribute the portion that was not covered by previous subsidies, or there are people who just refuse to stop practice of practicing open defecation due to their own preferences. Um, so we're kind of taking this approach where you have to do a little bit of everything um, to really understand how to get these people. So we have introduced subsidies. We're directly engaging local leaders through developing water safety plans. And in that process, they are mapping out what are the main risks to their water supply. And I think we have now completed 65 of those plans at the village level. And I think in 60 of them, they have highlighted the importance of having proper sanitation due to issues of flooding, contaminating their water supplies. So they're recognizing this as a water concern as well as a sanitation concern. So that's from the policy perspective. Um, we're also working with partners to train local community leaders to become sanitation champions and to push sanitation or help really engage those last mile population to develop a demand. Um, we're also doing a review of the social and behavior change communication materials that have previously been used to help try and target them further for the last mile population and those live, who live in difficult geographic conditions. Um, we're also working with Engineers Without Borders to really look at the available technology throughout Cambodia. There's a lot of really interesting things happening, but oftentimes they're very localized and not spread across the entire country. And so we're working with the Ministry of Rural Development to develop a catalog where the appropriate designs for different latrines that would be more appropriate for the different ge geographic conditions. And then we're also doing some other additional institutional strengthening. There were recent elections in Cambodia, and there has been a big push to become open defecation free. So how we can help partner with the government to really engage the private sector to um, better serve the um, overlooked customers. Um, so really, as I said, we are working primarily through these latrine business owners that are in Cambodia. We are focused in two provinces, and we did a survey of the current latrine business owners in those two provinces. And out of the 16 that we met with, only five of them were even willing to partner with us to engage the forest population because from their previous experiences, there's a lot of difficulty in engaging the population. And so one thing that we've definitely learned are subsidies are really important um, because without those subsidies, they would just skip those people and they say they're too difficult to work with. And then as I previously mentioned, we're also trying to get the local community leaders involved to really help push the behavior change and use their own um, social norms and other pressure to get these households to adopt latrines. So our current status is that we have started our subsidy program and we have, I think, signed about 1,000 contracts with four households that are agreeing to build the superstructure um, of these latrines. And we have made the latrine material subsidy conditional on completing the superstructure. And that subsidy is going directly to the LBOs themselves. So if the LBO builds the substructure and no one builds a superstructure, they will not get paid their subsidy. And so everything is targeted to the LBOs rather than the households themselves. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And that I think will show you how quickly just 
six minutes goes by for all the presenters. Um, so I'm going to ask our lovely presenters to just come up here real quickly. We have about a 10 minute Q and A session. Um, where you'll be able to ask any clarifying questions on their individual projects and presentations before we dive into our break breakout groups. So you guys can come on up. I need to grab them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So any questions in the room for our lovely presenter? Um, were they able to create a ready market for the Africans to sell their product? If, if they were able to do that, how did that happen? And what are some of the strategies they are happening to make it happen? And that's the first one. So the second one is the subtle plan. Um, it's I love the subtle plan. I the future business was about what they but how do we solve this issue by people thinking that the subject is a complete technology? And also, that is something about that. So I think yeah, this is what I have to have. I'll be very There's one more for the TPP, but let's Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's mostly for the online crowd. Yeah. yeah. So you just have to pretend. Thank you. Um, Yes, uh, creation of uh, sanitation demand is something that we keep doing uh, through a number of catalytic activities. Uh, first, we've been able to undertake a number of market activations, uh, but as we do those market activations, we also understand that there is quite a lot of sitting sociocultural uh, behavior or practices that we need to address. So as we do those market activations, we are also engaging in a lot of uh, behavior change campaign as to how we see sanitation and how communities can change their mindset uh, around sanitation management. Uh, together with that, uh, we are also strengthening the capacity of the local artisans um, because we do have a number of sanitation options that we promote, uh, such of just being one of them. Uh, and so that requires that uh, the customers, which in this case are the communities, are not only aware of the uh, different options but also understands the value that comes with each of those options. So the creation of the market uh, is done both at the demand side uh, to create the demand, but also strengthening the supply side. And that is why we are very, very keen on the collaborations with Sato, Lexel, and many other partners that we are working with. And of course, even as we do all this, making sure that uh, there is a very clear enabling environment, which requires local government is uh, really to... Um, have those uh, regulations, local regulations, and also policies that promotes the trading, business, selling, and buying of uh, sanitation goods and services. Thank you. So thank you. I'll, um, my understanding of the question was how do we solve the issue of people seeing Sato as the complete solution? And I would say there's um, kind of two ways we approach this one sort of short term or current and then um, longer term solution. In the short term, it's exactly what Paul just described. It's working with partners uh, who, as I described, have that visibility into the downstream supply chain actors and are closer to our consumers who can work with them to understand the product and both its benefits, but also its limitations and understanding what are um, what is a complete sanitation solution and the options there. That's kind of that short term, but in the long term, and also really what's happening now is we also continue to innovate as Sato and think about what are the products that we can offer? How can we use our team of amazing designers, one of them is here in the room, to uh, provide a more comprehensive solution for Sato? So we have the pit liner, for example, which is our first kind of big foray into containment, but we're looking bigger picture as well and what is Sato's role? Again, from our kind of product design perspective to facilitate safety managed sanitation. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so how do you ensure that people keep using these uh, sanitation products that are going into the uh, going into the field? Like are they still practicing open defecation, especially their elderly community network? How do you do with the uh, previous practice? 
or like is there any kind of um I don't know like post development discussion <laughs> on the like what kind of monitoring and evaluation protocols do you suggest based on your understanding? You have someone in mind you want to answer that? Uh -huh. Any more I can quickly say from the product design perspective is we design our products to be as affordable, but also as acceptable or aspirational for our users, such that they like using them, they're bought into the product and they want to keep using it. And so even if for some reason they're very damaged or, or an incident or they have to move house, they would actually take their Sasha pet with them and they continue to use it. So that's kind of how we tackle it from the design perspective. Yeah, I think um, successful interventions in sanitation go with a lot of uh, sensitization and awareness uh, creation. In our project, uh, we're trying to uh, focus so much on uh, ensuring that uh, we do the radio programs, we do um, you know various interactions with the communities uh, using you know languages and you know contexts that they understand. So that uh, they have a, you know a, a clear understanding of um, why they should move away from open defecation and why they should be able to uh, you know embrace uh, certain products. Uh, and I'm, I'm I'm happy that you raised the, the issue of monitoring and evaluation, which I uh, think is very very critical. And I must add learning as well. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, components that uh, we have factored into. Uh, you know the behavioral change strategy. Um, I think it is very very important to you know to keep um, looking at the results uh, as we are implementing these uh, these interventions. So um, I think uh, for us, we are just beginning to implement uh, the program. But uh, key is that uh, in terms of monitoring and uh, evaluation, we also want to bring in the digitization component because this is this has been one of the big uh, challenges of the rural areas um there's so many things being done but in terms of tracking the progress uh i think we seem to to have been weak so we will be distributing um uh, phones to community champions also environmental health technicians uh these um, are the individuals that uh be working very very closely um, under the village wash committees and with the dewash committees to ensure that uh, they are going around on uh, you know a regular basis as we are implementing behavioral change they are also capturing uh, the progress capturing what challenges uh, might be on the ground and they are providing uh, feedback in a more efficient and effective manner using a uh, digital uh, technology thank you so I think we have time for, I saw that there was a hand in the back. At least one more question before we go into the break record. Do you still have a question? Yeah, I think it's a quick one. Okay. Uh, a lot of the presentations talked about the like market-based sanitation activities that are happening. I just, um, what's lovely about market-based sanitation is there's a quick feedback loop of sales and you kind of know if what you're doing counts or not. <laughs> so I was curious uh, for Nambia, Kenya, and Cambodia, just curious, if, can you give an idea of scale? like? How many toilets have been sold for instance? Yeah, um, from the baseline, I think we are towards the transformation. I say transformation because uh, we are just beginning our year three, having started in uh, February 2022. And um, to date, the uh, number of SATO uh, products that we've been able to install are. Um, close to 50,000 or thereabout, and, and this is spread across a number of counties. Of course, the element of attribution is also yet another thing, uh, because the product was introduced in the market even before us. But then for this, we attribute to uh, mostly our effort uh, and probably uh, partner Lexel. Uh, but that is just one of the products. Uh, of course, not every customer in uh, Western Kenya would go for certain products. Uh, we do have full toilet solution and many other options. Um, but of course, customers make choices based on what they need the most. 
and also based on affordability. But uh, we are really getting the numbers. Thank you. Thank you. And for us, we just did our baseline a few months ago. So I can tell you that we have a thousand contracts with core households, but we're also working in one of the provinces where IDE had just been finishing up the development impact fund. So figuring out exactly what the uptake has been since that baseline in that province is something I'm not sure about, but together we could probably figure that out. <laughs> yeah, so for Zambia, I wouldn't really speak about um, the, the toilets um, in line with the, the products, the subtle uh, products. But just to say that uh, the target is to construct uh, about 50,000 uh, toilets. We designed a, a sanitation catalog which has different options and uh, key especially in the very rural areas is you know affordable toilets of course which uh, uh, meet uh, the minimum uh, requirements okay. so next we're going to move into some small group discussion so everyone can get in on the action of being able to talk about market-based sanitation um and so i'll say that we'll have three groups each group will have the opportunity to discuss all of the questions here, but the group that's listed, that's the question you're going to report back on. Okay, so you have the opportunity to discuss all the questions on the board, but um, group one is going to be the only one that responds to the one that they're assigned to, just to make it easier and we can get some unique takeaways versus reiterating the same thing group to group. Okay, so group one over here, um, it's going to be Mishani and Mark, our innovative strategies for stimulating local demand. Uh, group two, which I think the sign has fallen down, but is in the back. <laughs> um, that is going to be Genevieve and Fletcher talking about our uh, strengthening sanitation supply chain. And then um, group three in the back corner, uh, that's going to be our policy and regulatory frameworks for enabling market-based sanitation. So feel free to disperse to your groups. We're going to have about, sorry, we're only going to have about 20 minutes um, for our group discussions. You will need to pick a reporter for your group, and you will be able to present back when we're done. So see you guys in 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm 
for example, so it will be pretty much like the
So I don't share the experience and I so this help understanding uh, how marketing works. Like I am so very quickly and one of the best things about the company is that the main function is that the main belief 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 is that the the production tree and producers so that they have the opportunity to come together, uh, work to save money for their sharing the capital amongst themselves, and they have the capable order and direct kind of advocacy and that one to get like Taco or Hell and Hell and Hell and Hell and Hell and Hell and So, also thinking about ways to strengthen um, how businesses are able to work together and make sure to have shared branding and uh, um, we'll highlights from that part of the circle that really can. Yeah, I was, one thing also, like kind of person learned from the Cambodia market that I was doing, is each market is very unique. And like there is a community and investment understanding what each of the suppliers or businesses are facing. And that I was thinking about step one, because I was not fully aware of how to develop the market for Cambodia, which is definitely a different context than most of the other examples we discussed. But like walking in and already having a business that's not making a product that's not really this demand for it. Like for us, the question is how do you get to the core aspects of it? And like the very, very core is the Service. Uh, I was like, they, like, they turned away working with their to be in the, in the way that the families go and go and we get the influence in the market in order to go to the door or whatever you want in that part of the world. I think that's the case for us. It's something that I was like, we have to do this. And then we have to do this. I agree with you when we try to combine a house. We, yeah, we use the appearance of the one. Six months, where they will build 
And now we uh, with, uh, with the national, the national training yeah. training <laughs> institute to get and try to end this. I think it's part of uh, the certificate um, in the school year long. So, so now we can use it. Really the value of that is and how to be the mason the it will be there so now we try to push it to put them with the you are a mason without a now you will have one so that because they have trying it's really kind of you know, we, we do marketing for the state and we now we present them as the real world to tell the business if it isn't made on a certificate so it can be tried so we really this kind of so so but I think Amanda is going to join what you said about this mess model. I think that is really important. and at the end of the day, we create an other revival program called ATAP. And in this program, we have we mobilize people, but with other other countries, other other like dignity, 
So we encourage them to, to go through this and they understand that if they do open education, they will not allow it to help me and them, they will not end. But from like there, you can do things. So I, I, I put together so I put you never, 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 they, they, they started a <laughs> When I came, I stopped it with your but I don't want to oxidize and I don't want to, I had to. So we work together and other mobilization program, mobilization anime, animation. <laughs> There's a second half of this, maybe like the barriers that are faced up here. Because I, I was thinking about, I was thinking about this, and probably the number one thing that I see in every single organization is that they expect the nation or the salespeople to work for a lot less money than they're actually motivated, right? So this is with. I would say 99 of them are going to come out of the ship and put their family much less. And margins are much less than what is actually motivated by them, right? Usually by two or three. And so they end up having to raise and that upsets all the customers that, you know, because they're seeing this, this uh, staff a lot. And so I would say make sure that, that when you're running your project, pay your people to really set up the, the uh, mechanics to pay people. The main one, the main one, they have a lot of, they accept the question to work for a lot of price and only but after after the program when they have the, the certificate, they go alone and they do their own price because they are the first entrepreneurial first. They they teach them how to count their benefit, so they know how to measure their the, the expense and spend and everything and give a, a, a fair price to, to people. Yeah, it's almost like apprenticeship, right? And of entrepreneurship. Yeah, we have this in our courses. So when we teach them, so they know we, we leave them we, we, and we, we that they are, the action will continue, they will continue. Um, to to build the best but the the more more difficult in in the world because in in other zone I can I can no engineers no teach that they don't want this so now we have to engineer, civil engineer, civil engineer to teach how to make a good power plant because they did not think that it exists. So it's not easy. But important is that the training is going to be. The deliver of the message are going to be more efficient, more quality, and that will be about 30 more seconds. Exactly. With efficient and quality. And diversify your products. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, because for the housing situation that you were talking about, those main things, are you cut? Is the promotion to do like training or to do a training with the house? And which, which one is it? People, people, all, the all right, we're gonna wrap it up. I know there's great conversations going on, there's never enough time to go through them all. Um, you guys can come back together.
so we can make sure we have uh, enough time to get to our research. Oh, wow. Michelle, that was very generous of you. <laughs> I always say to the help. Ready to go. Okay. okay. <laughs> So we're going to first hear from group one on how can local entrepreneurs and businesses be supported to play a stronger role in the sanitation supply chain and what are those potential barriers that they face. So group one, Michelle, with our lovely reporter. I think you can, there's the mic. Yeah. Here you go. All right, thank you very much. So uh, group one um, had a lot of interesting points <laughs> and good examples from uh, different uh, countries. Uh, in no order at all, I think some of the key um, points that were brought up were that uh, firstly, it's important to have uh, strategic partnerships with uh, local entrepreneurs, and uh, these should be selected after extensive uh, research and um, that should also go with uh, business uh, models um, around uh, you know, entrepreneurship and to work to ensure that uh, this uh, helps to really reinforce uh, uh, re resolving of uh, the supply chain. I think they're having a hard time hearing you, so maybe just come to the okay, yeah. yeah, no worries. Yeah, so like I was saying, uh, this uh, works to just help uh, reinforce uh, issues around uh, su supply chain uh, challenges by ensuring that uh, the strategic uh, partnerships between government and uh, other bigger players and uh, stakeholders with uh, local entrepreneurs. In the group also discussed uh, the importance of uh, training muscles and uh, linking uh, these muscles up with uh, government uh, workers. There's an example that uh, was given uh, of the LBO model, where your government workers um, being there to closely uh, support and manage uh, local entrepreneurs. We had an example from uh, Latin America around the building capacity of muscles in the area of uh, designing um, uh, the sanitation facilities and ensuring that um, they are trained to, to better market and also uh, training should uh, enhance their business and technical skills. The other point that was discussed was around uh, helping to formalize um, uh, associations, bringing muscles together and ensuring that uh, um, they are trained around the, you know, the pricing. They are also supported to be able to pull uh, their, their, their financing together and have a shared brand to have uh, to ensure that uh, through the associations they have improved uh, the visibility. There was also a point around um, the importance of starting with um, an initial assessment um, because every market might be unique. So just to uh, to, to, uh, to 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 ensure that uh, there is a good assessment of uh, what is. Uh, obtaining in a particular market, and this should be followed up by you know, continual market uh, analysis, um, covering the context, the products that are available, as well as uh, also um, 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 mapping of the various uh, you know, stakeholders. There's also a point around the com point. community. This is the, the last point, <laughs> as the Lord that was said, but the community mobilization and just the emphasis of you know building and then moving away in a, in a way from uh, CLTS, which focuses on uh, naming and shaming, and uh, just uh, ensuring that uh, the communities uh, you know are mobilized in such a way that um, uh, sanitation services <coughs> are emphasized and uh, there is good marketing that goes with that. Let me end here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm a reporter for group two. Are you going to be loud or you need the mic? Um, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Here, but you can't be loud. 
Um, hi, Rana from IBE. Uh, I'll try to be brief. There was a lot of great discussion in our group. Um, primarily, we started the question with what kind of community-led interventions have been successful uh, when it comes to MBS. Um, and there was a little bit of silence, I think, at the beginning, but then we realized there are um, kind of uh, school-related um, uh, interventions that have been successful while potentially others um, maybe came in with uh, different assumptions that might not have um, had as good of community uh, related uh, engagement uh, from the beginning. Um, in terms of uh, partnering with the local uh, governments and different kind of uh, local um, municipality, like having community champions uh, as another intervention uh, that seemed, that was highlighted uh, in different contexts as well. Um, a human-centered design approach was one of the main uh, points that was part of like the design process of, of uh, innovation and technology when it comes to community engagement and really meeting the needs um, of, of those populations and ensuring uh, that that's kind of the basis on how um, you're creating ownership, desirability, affordability uh, and a lot of these uh, um, intervention uh, solutions that we're that we're bringing in. Um, and uh, the last main point was kind of around, you know, when we're thinking of um, the communities that might be the poorest, uh, most vulnerable, uh, and, you know, really thinking about scale and reach and those and, you know, when should we be digging deep and diving deep and trying to focus on that through markets but also try to reach scale. Um, and it is kind of a tricky question for sure, um, but realizing also how markets work and kind of really thinking of that um, as, as uh, uh, the steps within it and making sure that we're not kind of reinventing the wheel every time, kind of thinking of those existing products, those existing interventions that have been done and systems that have been successful and building on those to reach the more challenging um, places. That uh, was the last point. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay. We know this one's fast because I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Hello, my name is Nicole Weber. I'm with ProWash and Scale at Save the Children. I'm happy to report out for group three. So essentially, we focused on two main points, one around regulation and the other around clear standards for on-site treatment and waste management. Uh, we started off with a group member posing the question, is there appetite for regulation? There is a lot of um, a lack of regulation in some places by the government on on-site sewage management. And so is there an appetite to have this regulation? Um, in Kenya, our colleague noted that there is appetite um, and there is a policy, but sometimes there is a lack of enforcement. And in Ghana, um, our colleague noted that there is an assumption that there isn't any money in the sanitation business, so there seems to be less appetite currently, or at least less enforcement. Um, it, they, we also talked a lot about the need for clear standards for on-site treatment and waste management, and a discussion that should be focused on the performance of the product rather than focused on specific products. Um, there was also a focus around that this should be developed in a participatory method, and that it should be customized at the county level or the sub-county level, um, and that there should be enforcement, consumer education, and advocacy. There was also discussion that this should be focused on the strategy for subsidies. We had a good example from Cambodia where the strategy was centralized and that seemed to work really well. Um, in Ghana, there was an example that the, there is a national strategy, but it's not um, very coordinated when it is being rolled out. And then in Ethiopia, there is a subsidy protocol. Um, and then finally, it was noted that there is a big, Buried the sanitation market around financial capital for businesses and for entrepreneurs, which could then can influence um, this fostering this dynamic market. So I think that's all. But if I captured anything incorrectly, uh, feel free to correct me from the group members so that it's um, corrected before we close. <laughs> Thanks, group three, and um, thank you all again for taking the time out of your day and busy conference schedule to come and uh, attend the session. So before we close, I'm going to put all of our uh, speakers on the spot and ask them for their key takeaway that they got from today's session. So I'm looking around. Oh, Fletcher, you're okay. Everyone's avoiding eye contact. No one's going to Fletcher, you want to go first? I'll go. Um, <laughs> I think one of the key takeaways from the discussion so far is 
you know, sometimes there's an assumption, particularly amongst, you know, in our industry, that larger scale transactions are better just because it's a large amount of money involved. I think that's something that we can really take away is there can be real impact on these small scale people. So back to you. I see you hiding in the back. <laughs> oh, go ahead. My, yeah, my, my takeaway is that uh, uh, sanitation is a big business uh, based on the submission from Cambodia, Zambia, Kenya. But then uh, it takes effort. It takes, like I say, the potential to really uh, harness and bring that business into uh, supporting development of Cuba. All right. Well, you're eager, you're eager. <laughs> I think uh, my takeaway is that behavior change strategies need to be targeted at both households and salespeople and maintenance. And that it's a whole different sect that needs their own tools and approaches that we should have done. Yes. Uh, the critical role that uh, muscles play in the, uh, the citation space. Um, in our group, more than four people were just talking about the muscles. So for me, that really does stand out that uh, there's need to really focus on this uh, group. Um, I think that's a for me, my takeaway, I think, is a reflection on our group discussion and how much human-centered design came up. And it's something we've talked about, I would say, for a long time. But for me, it was a reminder of when I kind of get back to my laptop on Monday and get back into the day-to-day -day and the grind, I think it's really easy to fall back into old habits and fighting fires. And, and you know, we have an idea and let's just push it through. And a reminder that it's better to stop and take the time, engage our users, our suppliers, whom we're working with, make sure that what we're doing is viable and then and then proceed and, and bring in that kind of human-centered design element um, and just to remind ourselves it's better to go slow and far than mm -hmm. this, you know, whatever the metaphor is there. <laughs> All right, and it wouldn't be, I promised a participatory and active session, so it wouldn't be that if I didn't also open it up to the group to say if there's anyone that also wants to share a key takeaway from today's session. No one? No one took anything away? <laughs> well, I'll tell you one of my takeaways. Um, not that you're asking, but I'll tell you anyway, and then I'll let you go. Um, and so I know earlier we were talking a lot about that sanitation is, is a basic human right. And that's something that we think about all the time, but it's always so good to hear about how it feeds into all of these other sectors that we talked about, including um, public health, economic development, and environmental sustainability. So something that I think it's worth reiterating over and over and over, and that's why I love groups like this that you understand um, and can carry the banner forward in terms of market-based sanitation. So thanks everyone uh, for taking the time again to come and we'll let you go and enjoy the break.